Welcome to Lost Retro Tapes Retro Tea Time. Today we're embarking on an exciting journey to recreate the iconic ZX Spectrum with a special twist. On my birthday in 1984, my parents surprised me with my first computer, a 48K ZX Spectrum. Never really expected such an amazing gift, especially since we weren't used to receiving big presents. They even set it up at the TV and programmed a basic routine printing Happy Birthday Charles to the screen. And to this day I'm still baffled at how they managed that given their lack of tech savviness. Unfortunately, I never had the chance to unbox it or even see the original packaging, as it was likely discarded during the setup process. That or Dad bought it off a dodgy pupil at the school he taught at, who had liberated it from someone's house. This sparked my desire to not only rebuild the Spectrum, but also recreate the entire unboxing experience from 1984, complete with all the original components. So my goal is to construct a Spectrum using new parts that are either still in production or have modern equivalents and if I need to, reconstruct whatever is needed. So join me as we transform this bare PCB into a fully assembled box spectrum, complete with packaging, manuals, tape player, and of course the unforgettable Horizons tape. So grab yourself a cup of tea, dunk a biscuit, and let's kick off this nostalgic build together. Before you start anything, go to my website in the description and check the bill of materials to find links to order all the parts. And also make sure to print out or keep handy the PDF detailing where everything goes. This will be very helpful during the build. First thing we need is the PCB to base everything around. Thanks to the hard work of Pab, who has redrawn the issue 3B board, which is probably the most popular produced board, he has made Gerber files available for use with a PCB manufacturer. We decided to use G or C PCB for this. Taking the Gerber files you can download from the link in the description, upload them to GCL PCB. We have linked to our page where you can copy the settings to use. Add to the cart and decide how much you want to spend on shipping. If you go lowest, I warn you it can take a really long time to arrive, but it's a hell of a lot cheaper. After a decent rate, although the tracking is very good, Posty delivered the boards and they look great. First up, let's install the resistors. Ideally, they should arrive in individually marked bags, but if they've got mixed up, you can easily identify their values using the coloured bands on each resistor. There are many online resources where you can input the colours to determine the resistor's value. However, you can also quickly find it using the following method. Take a look at the image of the resistor, which has four bands. This is called a four band resistor. Each coloured band corresponds to a different number as shown to the chart on the right. Let's decode the bands from left to right. Okay, so the first band is yellow. According to the chart, yellow corresponds to four. Next up is the violet band, which represents a seven on the chart. The third band is brown, which gives us a one. However, this band represents the power to of 10. So in this case, 10 to the power of one equals 10. If it was three, then 10 to the power of three would be a thousand. Now let's combine the first and second numbers, so give us 47, and multiply the result by 10, giving us a value of 470 ohms for this resistor. Finally, we'll determine the tolerance, which is represented by the last band. In this case, it's gold, and the chart indicates a tolerance of 5%. This means the actual resistance can range between 446.5 and 493.5 ohms. A 5% tolerance is fine for the spectrum. And by a bit of luck, the 470 ohms is the first set of resistors we're going to install. To solder them, you'll need to bend the legs to fit through two holes on either side of the diagram on the board. You can do this by eye, but for a lot of them, I like to use a leg forming tool. If you have a 3D printer, you can print one out. There's a link to an STL in the description, or you can buy one. They're quite inexpensive and make it a lot easier and neater. Measure the hole using the tool to find out which notch to use to bend to the legs. You can see in the example we want five. Bend the legs and poke them through the hole. I like to keep everything neat and tidy, so I install them with the gold strips on the right hand side. Just makes the end build look that bit nicer. You can now either bend the legs from underneath to stop them falling back through when you flip the board over, or use some blue tack to keep them stable. If we have a lot to solder at one time, we use blue tack, otherwise we just bend the legs. Heat your iron to 350 degrees, flip over the PCB and solder the legs as shown. Sorry for the substandard soldering, it's a lot harder to film and solder at the same time, I'm trying to keep my big head out of the shot. And don't forget the big boy, this is a 1 watt resistor, so it's quite a lot larger than the other quarter watt ones. And finally a shot of the board with all the resistors soldered in all its glory. 
Now onto the capacitors. First type we're going to tackle the ceramic capacitors and we're using two different styles, the radial and axial. These can be installed anywhere around. We're just going to straighten the legs on the radials to allow us to use the leg bending tool and then install them like the resistors in the relevant locations. Now the axials. These are interchangeable but I prefer the look of the axial although they're becoming harder to secure these days. So in turn the radials will be all we can get. So now we get to the capacitors it's important to install the correct way around and for that we need to understand how to read the polarity. If you look at the example on the screen then you can see a bump at one end of the capacitor. This bump end will always be the positive side. Also notice the arrow pointing to a negative symbol. This will point to the negative side so there are two easy ways to find out the polarity. Install it making sure to use the printed board for the orientation. In this case the positive lead goes to the bottom. Similar story with the diodes. You need to take note though of the strip printed at one end of each diode. These should be aligned with the strip printed on the PCB when installing. In this example the strip is on the right hand side. You have to take care when installing the transistors as the way you need to install them is different to what is printed on the board as we're using modern versions. These can differ from the board markings. Refer to the PDF you hopefully printed earlier and it will tell you the orientation for each transistor. Responsible for generating a clock signal, these are a simple install with no need to worry about orientation. However you might need to bend the legs so they don't stick up and make the case impossible to install. I got the power, the snap sang. We're going to use a modern voltage regulator here. This is a huge improvement from the original used in the spectrum, reducing heat and stabilising power to it. Like always, slot through the holes and solder. For the mic and earports, when you get them they'll have four legs, but only three on the board. So grab your snipper and cut off the front right leg of each to allow them to fit. Watch your eyes though, they fly off quite badly. Now you don't need to use sockets, you can directly solder the chips to the board, but this isn't a good idea. Socketing allows you a much easier time replacing any chips that might be bad now or in the future. Starting with the keyboard connectors, just put them in either row on the board, it doesn't matter. Now the IC sockets, install with the notch matching the PCB diagram, usually at the top, and then blue tack and flip the board over. So what I like to do now is just solder two opposite points. This allows me to flip the board back, make sure the socket is flush to the board. If it's lifted up at all you can just hold the solder iron against the corner point in question and push it flush. Much easier than desoldering loads of pins when you find a slip socket. Solder the rest of the pins and then repeat quite a few times. The chips will now just slot into the sockets. You might need to slightly bend the legs to fit in, 
But make sure you don't bend them outwards when pushing them in. The upper and lower ramp should be socketed as the instructions that came with it, but you can easily work out where it needs to be aligned. It's amazing to think the Z80 is still in production. And now the LN1889N. The only chip in this entire build that doesn't have a modern replacement. I've looked everywhere for something. I found some new old stock, but I'm still trying to work out how to replace this with something modern. I'll make a follow up if I find one. Or if you have any idea, please let me know in the comments below. To be usable on a modern TV, we're using component video for our build. Using a single pin header, you can snap this off a longer line of them. Push through the hole and blue tack to hold in place. This is actually very important as it makes a ground connection for the video without which it won't work. Flip it over and solder in place. Do the same for the other side and place on the board and solder in place. Now add wire connections to the comp and 5 volt connections and solder these in place. Talking about wiring, we need to put the jumpers in. At the top of the board, we're going to connect the TI and the free jumper. Just one wire between the two ends and solder from the other side. This tells the Spectrum what type of upper RAM we are using, and for the modern replacement, this is the correct configuration. Then at the bottom right, we're doing the two vertical jumpers in the end. I found using tweezers here was quite useful. These were used in the original to tell the spectrum what ROM type was being used. Again for our config, this is correct. And we're all done. Oh, hopefully. Time to run the first tests. The ROM, if you ordered the one from our bill of materials, has two modes. Mode A, which is ZX Basic, and Mode B, which has the popular Retroleum Diagnostic ROM. Switch on to A, plug in the component video and the power, turn on, cross fingers, and hopefully you'll see the ZX Basic screen. Result. Now turn it off, switch on to B, and then turn back on. You should see the Retroleum Diagnostic screen. It will automatically test the RAM, and hopefully like ours, comes back good. Okay, now it's all tested okay, let's put the case together so we can use the keyboard, run a few further tests, and load up a game. Now don't forget to put it back into mode A before we put the case together. Screw in the motherboard. Give it a little wiggle to make sure it's secure. Now attach the keyboard ribbon, it just slots in. Put the case together, flip over and screw together. Top tip here, put a cloth down when doing this. I forgot and scuffed a little mark on the spectrum. 
Luckily it wipes off, but the cloth will present this stupid me. Put on the lovely rubber keys and then the faceplate. Taking off the double sided tape, stick this to the keyboard. Lastly add the rubber feet to the bottom. Oh look I remembered to put a cloth down. Too late now idiot. We now have a beautiful looking mint spectrum. Right, now I'm going to use my external petroleum card to run some additional checks. This isn't 100% required. You can just check by loading up some games but it allows me to firstly run some tests that aren't available without the keyboard being plugged in and also load a game from the SD card so we can test it before getting the tape player working. It tests the memory again on startup and then we can use the menu to check various bits such as the ROM, the ULA and everything else. I won't bore you with them all. Instead I'm going to congratulate myself with guessing it all working with a quick game or something. There's only really one game to test it with, and it's the game I test all my Spectrum builds with, Manic Miner. I just love this game. I find it hard to explain how much, but for 39 years I've played this game at least once a month. Never completed it. Not just because it's unfair, just not good enough. But I will keep trying and trying and trying. It's just such a perfect thing, I love it. Ah, oh, the manuals, the start of many of our programming careers, I am sure. The iconic orange covers, but the ones you see now are understandably dog eared, torn, and ravished by time. I was going to have to recreate them and get them professionally printed. So, first the cover, and I needed the image to use. John Harris was the artist, and my friend Gary Arnott on Twitter had restored the image to a nice decent resolution, and I was able to use this as my base. First thing to do was to get it into Photoshop. Grabbing the image from his Twitter, I opened it up, converted it to CMYK as it's for print, not screen, and compared it to a reference cover. First thing I noticed is I need to flip it. Then I needed to remove a lot of the colour, essentially turning it duotone with the orange and black, but not as dark as well. So to do this, I used the hue and saturation panel and colourised it, adjusting the hue, saturation, and brightness. I also played with the curves and levels and ended up something I was pleased with. Then into InDesign to put it all together. There's a more in-depth guide on my site linked in the description, but I managed to find decent scans of the original manual that I could use with a bit of cleanup that saved a ton of time. The type on the cover I recreated in Illustrator and brought in and laid it all out. Once complete I exported to a print ready PDF and could send it to the printer. The file's on my website to use. I went to the printer's website, uploaded the file and selected all the specs. Unfortunately I wanted to have it ring bound, but I was 12 pages too long. I'm hoping the printer in the future will allow me to do a new ring bound one, but Sinclair did produce some perfect bound manuals, so it is still somewhat period accurate. Once uploaded we can check the safe area and bleed, and once done a proof of print. And the postman delivered. I was exceptionally happy with the result. They look absolutely amazing.
On to the Horizons tape, and of course we need some food of all in our life for the complete 1984 experience. It was the first one I ever played on the Spectrum, I loved it. I downloaded a .tap file from the web, and also an app called ZX Tap to Rav. Links will be on the website. Put them all in the same folder, and navigated to it in a command window. I then ran the app with the tap file as a parameter. It takes the tap file and then creates an audio rav file from it. Opening this rav file in Audacity, we need to split it into two files. One for side A and the other side B. I actually did this by timing the Real Horizons tape. But you can also use something like Speculator to load the file where split to see if it loads the correct part of the tape. However, this is quite cumbersome and boring and you don't actually need to do this as I've done it for you and the split files are again on the website. Save as an unsigned 8-bit PCM or it won't work if you try it in Spectacular. The tape recorder is a brand new model from Bush bought from Argos. Modern tape players are quite notoriously bad, so I didn't have particularly high hopes for this and the first impressions weren't great. It felt cheap and the top didn't close easily. Actually, I was quite pleasantly surprised. I plugged in an audio lead, which you need to make sure is mono, from the AUX port to the headphone port on the PC. Press record with a blank tape in the tape player, and then played each side in Audacity on the PC. This transferred the audio from the computer onto the cassette tape. You might need to check your levels a few times. Once done, rewind the tape and put it back in the computer. Swap the audio lead into the ear port on the tape player and the ear port on the Spectrum, which is the one on the left. Type in the classic load quote quotes, so press J for load and symbol shift P twice for the quote marks and press enter. Press play on the tape player and it should load with those wonderful Spectrum loading noises. I sped this up 400% so you don't need to look at the entire loading process. Ok that done, let's make the actual tape look like new. I recreated the tape label and printed them onto Avery label sheets. Using a circle cutter for a nice neat circular cut by the tape spool, I cut out the label and stuck it to the tape. Then the cover I recreated, again files on the website and professionally printed. Just need to score the fold marks. I find using the corner of an old credit card or my Q Gardens membership card as used here works perfectly. Fold the tape cover up and place it into the box with the tape and it's ready for the final stage, shrink wrapping. Nothing says mint like a bit of shrink wrapping. But I found these heat shrink bags at eBay. I think they normally use for soaps or something. So 
by placing the tape and then use the soldering iron to seal the open edge and tear off the excess. Then you can use a hairdryer to shrink the plastic, but I had a heat gun handy so I just used that. Okay, it's not production perfect, but I think it's pretty darn good. Last part of the build is the box, and again links for this on the site. Manuals and tapering first, and then the spectrum. Then the stickers that came in the box. And finally the power supply on the right hand side. Put the lid on. Put it into the cover. And we have our mint spectrum, like you would have had to come back from the shops with in 1984, all ready to unbox on Christmas Day or your birthday. I'm so happy with the way this has turned out. It's been a really fun thing to do, so many different things to make the build work. Going forward there's obviously the one chip I haven't managed to find a still produced or reproduction of. And also I want to make my own box as there are improvements I think that could be made with the reproduction quality and the print quality, but I will follow up with those at a later date. Should you do this build? Well if you just want to work in Spectrum, probably not, the cost is very high. I estimated this build was around £400, but that did include multiple bits such as 10 manuals, I think 5 PCBs where there was a minimum order quantity, so subsequent builds should be cheaper. So if you just want a Spectrum, go to Sinclair for Sale on Facebook and pick one up there. But if you want to do something pretty unique, then this is a really fun build. So grab yourself a nice cup of tea, or 20, and give it a go. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you've enjoyed it. Please do leave a comment below about anything, and check out my other channel at Lost Retro Tapes to be transported back to the 80s with bites. And I look forward to seeing you for the next Retro Tea Time.